what it can do next. Well, it got a representation from the server that has hyperlinks in it, and those hyperlinks, the hypermedia, that's the engine of the application state. That's how the application knows what it can do is because it knows it can follow hyperlinks. And that's what we mean by a hypermedia application. Okay, so Haiti OS. Hypermedia's application of, uh, you know, uh, engine of application state. Uh, even though this is core to what it means to do REST, most developers don't get it. Well, what's the problem, right? You have this whole, this whole discussion of REST. If you knew Google REST, there's this whole, this whole religious community of Restafarians, is what they call themselves, as though it was a religion. You know, it's not a religion, it's just an architectural style. But they follow, they think they're following REST, but the, most of them, have no idea what REST really is because they don't understand Haiti OS. They think REST is a way of building simple APIs using HTTP and with four of those four operations, uniform interface. As though that was the whole story. Well, from our perspective, that's like saying, well, I want to build this, this skyscraper, but I don't know how to build skyscrapers, but I do know how to mix mortar, so I'm going to mix a bunch of mortar. And now I know how to uh, you know, uh, stick bricks together. And hopefully, if I stick enough bricks together, I'll end up with a skyscraper. Well, that's not a good way to build a building, right? You mix the mortar and hope the rest works out. No, you have to architect the building. You have to say, this is how you build a building, right? And then the mortar is, is, part, is a key part of the story, but you don't want to confuse the glue with the architecture, right? And uh, building uh, APIs is the glue that gets distributed computing to work, but it's not the architecture, right? REST is a style for building hypermedia applications, and those are the things you have to architect. You have to think about, well, what application do I need based upon the business needs? If the business doesn't need a hypermedia application, don't use REST. REST doesn't solve every problem. It's for building hypermedia applications. Not every application is one of those, so you have to know whether or not it's appropriate. Okay, so HadeOS in action. How does HadeOS work? Well, HadeOS dynamically describes the contract between the client and the server in the form of a workflow at runtime. So this is a key point. That's why I put it in red, big letters. Really big, really big letters. So let's make sure we understand this, right? The, how does the client know what it's supposed to do? The server gives it representations with hyperlinks that are a runtime workflow. So what is a workflow? Well, it's essentially a business process with human steps where the technology uh, interacts with people as they work their way through the, the process. Well, if you're, you're sitting in front of a computer clicking links on web pages, that's a workflow. Right? The application is the website, and the workflow is the sequence of web pages you click through. And it's a runtime workflow, because what are the links in the web pages? Well, it's whatever the resource gives you. Are they static? Possibly, but not necessarily. Right? If you've done any uh, server uh, web programming, right? if you're building a PHP script and you're building uh, uh, hyperlinks for the client to follow, those can be dynamic. They could be different every single, for every single individual who goes to that web page, they might have different hyperlinks. If you go to your Facebook page, you'll see you know, a whole bunch of links in your wall or whatever. Well, it's different from the next person's. Everybody's wall is different. They all have different hyperlinks. But it's all the same web page in the sense it's all the Facebook web page. But the workflow is a runtime workflow. And the hyperlinks dynamically describe the contract between the client and the server. That is, of all the things the client might do, it's constrained by the hyperlinks. So what can you do from your Facebook page? You can click the links, you can type in the fields, you can submit the, you know, hit the, hit the submit button and update your status and things like that. That's all you can do. Why? Because that's all Facebook lets you do, because that's what it means to use Facebook, right? So that's the contract between the client and the server in the form of a workflow at runtime. Okay. So, key point here, right, these URIs, you can think of them being, they're generally URLs in the case of a web environment. They could be static or they could be dynamic. And how does the client know what they are? Well, the client simply has to have a starting point. One URI it knows to follow to get into the application. And what do we call that? A bookmark. Because right? that's what it is. That's what a bookmark is. A bookmark is a saved URI you use to start your interaction with an application. Right? That's what we mean by a bookmark. So once you follow that bookmark, 
then it's up to the, the hypermedia application to tell you what you can do next. And it might be different every time. Might not, but it might be different. And it might be different for every user, depending upon what the application is supposed to do. So um, the, the links can be contextual. Right? What you can click might depend upon what you clicked before. It might depend upon who you are or other context, other application state information. So again, the, the hypermedia becomes the uh, state application state engine. So when we talk about uh, internet media types, we talked about you know, XML and JSON and HTML and some other, you know, in, you know, PDF and some others. Well, those are all standard internet media types. Right? And if you're programming at that level, you can go look them up. Um, I think it's IANA maintains those, and you can go look them up and say, oh yeah, there's this, this obscure uh, you know, media type thing for this application. But you can come up with your own, called custom media types. So here's the standard format for custom media type at the top here, application slash VND. VND stands for vendor, because the idea is that a software vendor would come up with their own custom media types, but it could be your own organization. You can be your own vendor. The dot zap thing, just indicate that's us. We created our own media type. And this is our PO, so purchase order. Let's say I wanted to come up with my, uh, a custom purchase order media type just for my customers. So it'd be zap, a VND .zap thing .po, and I put the Plux XML because it's going to be in an XML format, but it's a custom schema for this particular uh, media type. So the goal here is to put whatever sort of additional contextual information or semantic information into the interactions. So if I wanted to have this custom purchase order format with all of this semantic information about what it means to, to, to you know, send a purchase order to my company, I can do whatever I want. This gives me the ability to put semantic information into these interactions. Uh, of course, the downside is the client has to know about this media type ahead of time. But that's the way it is with semantics, right? Semantics is all about getting together in a room and agreeing on what you mean by terms. And REST doesn't solve that problem, but it gives you a formal way of putting semantic, custom semantic information into your interactions in the form of custom media types. So it's not the best solution in the world, but it's, it's how REST does it. Okay. So this talk is on REST-based SOA. So I've done an introduction to REST, but we have to talk about the SOA part of the story as well. And a key part of the story here is, well, what does it mean to be a service in the context of SOA? And what would a REST-based service be? So that would be a key part of REST-based SOA. Well, when we say service in the context of SOA, we mean a contracted service. Right? Service has a contract, so that's, that specifies essentially the interactions between clients and servers that interact um, uh, interact with uh, in, in, in the context of that service. So, where is the contract in a REST-based interaction? Well, the four operations, get, post, put, and delete, are part of the story. Right? If you look at a WSDL file, operations are part of the story, but there's more to WSDL, and there's more even in the web services world. Uh, it could be, you know, WS policy, content, XML schemas could be part of the contract as well in the web services world. In the REST world, we have the four operations, but we also have the, hyper, the hypermedia, right, the, the workflow at runtime, and, uh, and we also have contract information in the representations. So what do you mean by this? Well, here's an example. Let's say I want to fill in a form, right? So I'm the client here, I get some page that has a form on it. So what does the server do? It sends me a page with a form on it. And here's a, a piece of that, right? So there, there's a form tag, this is HTML, right? As an action, there's the hyperlink, it has a method, there's the operation, and then what's next? A bunch of form fields, you know, input or whatever, or text area, whatever. So a bunch of form fields. So the next thing, what can, what can the client do now with that web page? They can fill in the form and submit it, right? Or maybe click a link and do something else. But if they want to submit the form, they're going to post to that URI, and they're going to have the post data is going to contain the information that they put into the form. So, what constrains that? The form itself. So, where is the contract? Well, it's in the operations, it's in the hyperlinks, and it's in the representation that constrains the next thing the client can do. Okay, so hyperlinks create the workflow at runtime. Contract metadata might be in representations to constrain further requests. Uh, media types 
are part of the contract information, right? If the server says, you know, this is a, a, a HTML file, the client knows it can only do certain things because HTML only does so much. But if it's a different representation, you might have other uh, different media type, you might have other interactions. And namespaces as well can be part of the story where uh, it provides some, some of the contract information, uh, especially if you have an XML interaction. You know, if you have an XML interaction, there's a namespace associated with it, then, you know, so you know what the tags mean, that's also part of the contract information. So in the web services world, it's a WSDL file, WS policy content, sometimes SOAP, although you shouldn't use SOAP for the contract, uh, and XML schemas, but you store all that stuff in your repository somewhere. In the REST world, this is where you find the con contract metadata. Okay, so if you're doing REST-based SOA, you have to follow the rules of REST and follow the rules of SOA. There's no, nobody's saying you have to do that, right? The core principle is you should use whatever tools are right for solving the business problem at hand. It may or may not be REST, it may or may not be SOA, but if REST-based SOA is the right approach, what does that mean? Well, you should follow some key best practices. Uh, all endpoints, so these could be client endpoints, uh, uh, resources, topics, if you're, uh, if you're using asynchronous interactions and you want to subscribe to some topic, they should follow a common URI format. Now, the rest does not necessarily require this, right? You don't have to follow a common URI format, but you should if you want to have REST-based service. And this is something actually the U.S. Coast Guard did uh, with, with great success. So that's a key part of that Coast Guard story. All requests and topics should be handled on an intermediary. So we didn't talk about intermediaries. Where we use the term client and server. But those terms client and server in the REST context, those are abstractions. Right? They aren't necessarily uh, meant to indicate we have a client-server architecture. Right? That may be one kind of you know, request-reply approach. It might be one way of doing it. But the client could be itself be a server for another request. Right? And we could have an intermediary that serves as a client for your resources on the server and then acts as a cache, for, so acts as a server for other re requests. So in REST-based SOA, we want to use the intermediary because we want to resolve all endpoint references on the intermediary. And this gives us the core abstraction that makes services in the SOA context loosely coupled, is that we're resolving abstracted endpoint references in a flexible way that gives us the flexibility of SOA. So intermediaries should do this resolution for you. So you have this common URI format that all endpoints have, and then the intermediary transparently to the client resolves them into the physical endpoint references. And this is where you have all the flexibility and power of SOA. But because these are REST-based uh, endpoints, you have the benefits of REST as well. Uh, every resource should have a contracted representation. You may have other representations as well, right? So the resource might give you some sort of contracted representation that basically is constrained uh, based upon the um, the endpoint uh, reference, but there could be other representations as well. So it could be a web form, but you might, you might fetch an image. And, and all it is is an image, and that's fine too. But at least one of the representations should be a contracted representation. Now the payloads, that is the messages themselves, they may or may not be loosely typed. In the web services world, uh, because we're conforming to schemas, we end up with strongly typed, uh, strongly typed messages. And that limits our flexibility. Uh, strong typing is essentially a compile time check. We want to make sure there's no bug in our program at compile time. But we want runtime checks to be uh, uh, based upon um, uh, loose typing. Right? This is the way JavaScript works. Right? Is it a string? Is it an integer? Well, I'll make it my mind later. You know, if it looks like a string, it's a string. It looks like an integer, it's an integer. Right? And I don't want to throw a compile time error at runtime. Uh, you may contain hyperlinks, right? Not every payload has to contain hyperlinks, but if I want to build a hypermedia application, it's going to be based on hyperlinks. And it may or may not conform to custom media types if I want to include custom semantic information in my interaction. That's more of an advanced capability. So most organizations don't do that, but it's, it's part of the rest story if you do want to do that. Okay. So differences between web services-based SOA and REST-based SOA. And there's key, key parts of the SOA story, and we'll go through each of them. So contracts, right? There's a bit of review since we went through this. In the web services world, 
Contracts are documents external to the participants. Right? Whistle files are external to the server, to the client. Right? They're stored somewhere else. They're fixed at design time. Right? The whistle doesn't change at runtime. Right? It's something you design as part of specifying the service itself. So how do you update a service? Well, you have to go through a governance-driven versioning process, which can be elaborate and complicated. And we spent a lot of time talking about this in our LZA course because this is one of the big headaches of web services-based SOA. The REST-based world, contracts, Contract metadata are in different places, right? The links, the media types, namespaces, and the representation context, right? Representation tells you what you can do next. And it's dynamic at runtime, right? So the contract can change however the server says it should change. It doesn't have to be, but it gives you a lot of flexibility. So you don't have to worry about versioning a REST-based service the way you do a web service. What about operations? Well, in the web services world, right, operations are specified in WSDL, and even though we're, we, uh, uh, we realize we should have document-style web services, even a document-style web service has operations in the WSDL file, which still have an RPC heritage that gives us no end of headaches. And if you've worked with web services, the operations are where all the headaches seem to be because every vendor does them differently and, and you know, how many operations can you have and you won't have agreement on, it's a big headache, right? Well, REST solves that problem. Get, post, put, and delete there, we're done. Okay, those are our operations. So we're able to avoid any RPC characteristics. All we're doing is sending and receiving messages, the messages are self-descriptive, and the clients know ahead of time what the operations are. So this gives us the, the flexibility of essentially uh, freeing ourselves from the RPC mentality. How do, what's the difference in how we deal with data in the web services versus REST-based approach? Well, in the web services world, data, if we're using document style web services, they are uh, constrained by the XML schemas. So they're strongly typed. Uh, semantic information is largely manual. We can try including you know, uh, RDF uh, in our web services, but that's a, that's a huge mess if you've ever tried to, to include semantic information in web service interactions. So it's typically done manually. We, we're, we, we have XML schemas that provide syntactic information, but semantics is largely not part of the web services story. In the REST-based world, the representations can be of various media types, right? So we're not constrained to XML. We can use it if, if we want, of course, but we don't have to. Uh, we can be strongly or loosely typed, gives us additional flexibility. Uh, and semantic information can be specified in custom media types if we want, but as I said, that's an advanced capability, and it, it's, it's not without its own problems. Right, it doesn't solve all the problems. There's data, by the way, in case you didn't get that. <laughs> and what about handling state? Right, this is one of the key ones. The web services world, there's no good answer. Right? This, this is one of the huge headaches with web services. Because where we put state information? Well, we could try putting it on the consumer, the service consumer. Uh, either by using HTTP cookies, except that we don't necessarily have HTTP, or maybe we use WS addressing. Well, IBM sort of does that, Oracle doesn't, so it's a big mess. Uh, so we don't want to use the client. We could uh, rely upon custom message headers, put state IDs into our SOAP headers. Well, that's not part of the SOAP standard, so we have to customize our message headers. So instead of using SOAP, we're using our version of SOAP, that's usually a deal killer, right? Because now we can't send messages to third parties. So what, uh, what's the fallback? Well, it's the middle one here. We, do, we rely upon the underlying runtime. So we have an e, a traditional ESB, which is a bunch of, which maintains state by spawning threads, which are short-lived objects. Now we have to write thread state to the hard drive, and, and uh, we can't, if we try to integrate one ESB with another, we have all these uh, headaches, where you can't take a Java thread and ship it to some other runtime environment. Right? That's not the way threads work. So, uh, so we're essentially locked into a particular traditional vendor approach to state. Uh, I think it's just a big conspiracy. Right? Because it's a, way of, it's a way of the vendor saying, oh, well, they pretend they're doing so, but they're really locking you in. So that's why it's so cool to, to see how Fiorano does it. I'm not, I'm not here to plug Fiorano, but Fi this, is, this is where Fiorano is significantly different from all the other ESP players, is that they handle state differently. So the REST-based world, rely upon hyperlinks. That's it. 
right? The messages are self-descriptive. All the state information you need is transferred in the message to the client, and hypermedia is the engine of application state, right? That's the story. That's, that's, that's why REST is such an important part of the SOA story. Okay, that's it for my talk, my first talk. Uh, so uh, up next is a, a tool from uh, Fiorano, and then I'll be back with a bit of the cloud computing story. There we are. Thank you. Oh, he's just stepping out, so I guess that means there's a time for questions. <laughs> yeah. This was a very good talk, thank you. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, you mentioned that it makes sense to transfer a lot of state uh, information to the consumer and uh -huh. uh, let it scale out. So how does that balance in terms of uh, that scalability versus security? Because a lot of times, consumers cannot be always trusted and yeah. Well, that's an important point, right? That's sort of the common wisdom, or you know, the um, you know the, the common rule is you don't want to put you don't want to let the consumer or the client take uh, responsibility for anything that could screw something up. Right? Because you never know if your client is really a customer or just a hacker pretending to be a customer. Right? And they can write their own browsers. Who knows what they're going to do right? if the hacker gets a hold of them. So that's, that's a, a key part of the story. Um, and it's something we're actually going to talk more about in my second talk because that's part of the cloud story as well. So one of the things I'll be talking about later this morning is how we maintain resource state on the server and, and application state on the client. And so the server still does part of the story. Uh, including some of the security uh, part of the story, as well as anything, any state information that should be shared across different um, clients. But one of the examples I'll use is how Amazon does this. If it, Amazon uses this approach, right, if you're in the Amazon shopping cart, uh, if you view source, you'll see all the state information in the hidden fields in your uh, web forms. And you could, if you're a hacker, you can go in and you can monkey with those hidden, hidden field data. And the worst that could happen is you'll screw up your own damn shopping cart. That serves you right. But you're not going to be able to steal anything from Amazon or you know, buy something you don't pay for. That sort of stuff is maintained on the server. But what's maintained on the client? Things that are really belong to the client. Right? This is the client's application. If they need to do something on the server, like execute a, a credit card transaction or you know, uh, change your database or something like that, that's maintained on the server. So the worst that can happen is the client screws itself over. And it serves them right. <laughs> you think about it. Any other questions? I mean, I'll be back up. So if you have more questions for me, I'll you know, there'll be more questions at the end. But yeah. Just one question: Can REST operate on async mode? You know, yes, the absolutely, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, absolutely the case. When we say client server, it's one of the points I wanted to make is those are terms that are abstractions. It isn't necessarily client server in the sense of request reply. And you know, I put in that notion of topics because sometimes uh, the interactions are one way. But it's something Atul will be talking about as well because, of course, they do asynchronous REST all the time. Yeah. The problem is it looks the same as synchronous, right? Okay, are we ready? So switch uh, that mic here. Uh, yeah. Do you want to do a Q&A now? Yeah, you can do a Q&A with Jason right now. Well, we just, we just had something, but we have more later too. Yeah. Absolutely. I can just carry on with my talk, and then we do a full Q&A again with Jason. Jason. Yeah. Because, yeah, get my presentation up, yeah. Jason. That'd be lovely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is essentially like, a, think of it as a continuation of Jason's talk, but more in terms of a practical, actual practical example. So what we're going to talk about is implementation of REST-based SOA and specifically what, uh, what the Coast Guard has actually done. It's done quite a, quite a significant implementation. So key characteristics. So REST-based SOA at the Coast Guard. So the whole concept is... It's event-driven, document-centric, loosely coupled, asynchronous, message-based. So SOA, think, think of it, think of it uh, in terms of simple terms. In simple terms. This component, the business service is like a software component, right? And what you're going to have, what you're going to have is 
different components on the network, messages flowing between them. The state is carried in the message. There's no central state. 